Well, uh, thanks, Greg, for the for the introduction. I'm glad that uh, we, we have this uh, intimate gathering so I can share a little bit about the, uh, uh, this is just part of really a book project uh, that I'm working on uh, for the Naval Research Laboratory. And I'll tell you a, a little bit about that in a couple of sort of contextual slides to begin with. So uh, the Naval Research Laboratory is actually situated along the Potomac River, kind of by the confluence of the Potomac and Anacostia. Uh, if you look across the river, you actually see the uh, uh, Reagan National Airport. So when you fly in, and if you know what to look for, you'll actually see this campus. Um, and there's a building uh, kind of in that sort of right by the river uh, next to the large uh, hangar-like building that, ha that has a, uh, um, an upwardly facing 50-foot uh, parabolic antenna, which in its day was, uh, was actually the, the sort of state of the art for radio astronomy. It uh, doesn't work now. There are pigeons, uh, typically, that uh, uh, perch up in there. And God knows what's in the, in the middle of that parabola. Um, and where the lab sits um, in the structure of the Navy is really under the chief of naval research, um, rather than under any of the uh, naval uh, commands, which means that it's actually much more uh, uh, almost like a corporate laboratory. That's really how NRL thinks of itself. Uh, interestingly, its origin goes back to Thomas Edison. Um, who uh, argued to uh, the, the Secretary of the Navy back in the 19 teens that uh, warfare was going to become more technological. Uh, and so the Navy needed a corporate lab, much like GE has had its corporate lab, or Corning has Sullivan Park and all of the great uh, uh, sort of materials and chemical and, and technology related companies in, the, in that early part of the 20th century ended up having corporate labs. So NRL, uh, Naval Research Laboratory, became uh, the corporate lab of the Navy. Um, uh, and it's, in its earliest days, uh, it was mostly populated by radio engineers. And the problem of the day actually has a lot, uh, was planted the seeds for uh, what was on the uh, opening title, which was the, the world's first spy satellite. Um, in that, uh, uh, what was happening around the, the 1920s was that the baby was actually very thrilled that there was a, a, f a radio phenomenon uh, uh, by which high frequency uh, signals would travel uh, around the curvature of the Earth almost sort of miraculously. Although people did know that the reason that was happening was because of the ionosphere, which acted sort of like a radio mirror. Um, and so uh, signals from a transmitter would, would uh, bounce off the ionosphere, this radio mirror, come back down to the Earth, bounce from there, and actually ricochet uh, to uh, 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 spots uh, around the curvature of the Earth, many thousands of miles away. Uh, the problem is, is that the ionosphere was a wild animal. And it would, it would change its position in the sky. Its, its, uh, it, its uh, mirror properties would change. Uh, there was ideas that this had something to do with the uh, uh, kind of charge characteristics. Uh, but even in, in, in the 20s, it was clear that the only way to really understand the ionosphere was to do in situ measurements, which is to say to get instruments up into the ionosphere, which was an, an, an something that was impossible in the 1920s, though even then there was plenty of dreaming and thinking about uh, rockets, and, 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 uh, which would be the tool of, to, to get instruments up there. So there was a fair amount of dreaming going on at NRL in that idea, particularly the upper atmosphere research group and the radio engineers. Um, and uh, it took a war <laughs> uh, to uh, bring the, uh, what uh, was initially an instrument of warfare, the V-2 rocket, the most powerful rocket of, of its time, used in the latter part of World War II, uh, by the Nazis as a, uh, a kind of really more of a terror weapon. It did not change the outcome of the war, but these were fitted with warheads and rained down primarily on London and in Belgium. Uh, and uh, 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 th these then, however, would become uh, uh, interesting tools of research. Uh, and at NRL, because of this man here, Ernst Krauss, um, in the, during World War II, uh, he really headed up uh, and initiated and headed up a guided missile program at NRL uh, and, um, and ended up um, in uh, one of the, the missions, the Allied uh, missions to go into Germany, discover what kind of R&D had been going on there um, and, uh, and bring this knowledge back. Uh, and one of the things he learned there was all about the V2 program. Uh, and when he came back, along with others who were in that sort of technology discovering mission, uh, they, uh, they saw that these tools, these V2s, would be fantastic instruments to take upper atmosphere research to a new place. 
And so uh, right at the end of the war, uh, uh, the, the Allies, particularly the United States, loaded up 300 boxcars worth of uh, uh, V-2 remnants, enough to really put together scores, or some say up to 100 V-2 rockets. Uh, and most of this, uh, this material ended up in White Sands, New Mexico, at the, uh, the, proving, the proving ground there, uh, for two purposes. One was really for the United States to begin to get its missile chops down, because missiles were going to forever be part of warfare now. But the upper atmosphere research community also instantly saw that they now had these tools to do some in situ measurements high up, higher up in the atmosphere than they've ever been able to do before. This is actually a picture uh, from uh, the underground middle work or central works, which was an absolutely hellish, horrific place where 250 uh, slave prisoners were dying every day um, building the V2s. Uh, but this, is, this shows you some of what went into the, those 300 boxcars that ended up at White Sands uh, Proving Ground. Uh, here is a, uh, an image of, of some of those parts coming together now into what now, rather, would, rather than a weapon, uh, this was now a V2 uh, rocket for the purpose of, of science. Um, and uh, uh, the, the upper atmosphere research community, which included NRL, but also many <coughs> other uh, uh, organizations in the country, uh, found ways of, of fitting uh, the stabilization fins and uh, also the, the, uh, under the fairing and the top with various kinds of instruments uh, for uh, lots of, uh, of types of measurements, both uh, the conditions up of the upper atmosphere, ionosphere, um, but also uh, you know, some cosmic ray uh, instruments, uh, uh, solar energy detect uh, measuring instruments, particularly for uh, UV and X-rays because uh, the, the, uh, the upper atmosphere researchers knew that it was that solar energy, uh, energy uh, interacting with the, the molecular species in the ionosphere that had everything to do with the properties of the ionosphere and therefore how that was affecting uh, um, uh, long distance communication with the high frequencies. Uh, so this is just kind of a, a, a standard view of, of uh, the kind of uh, instrumented rockets that went up in, in really some frequency, it's sort of more, more like on a, on a kind of a monthly basis and sometimes more frequently within that. So at NRL, they really got hooked on this. Uh, they were very excited to have this kind of uh, research capability, but they also knew that the V2 supply was going to run out. It was, in, it, was, uh, it was fated to be depleted, um, and so uh, NRL researchers decided that they're going to also become rocket engineers. Uh, um, and they did so in collaboration with the Glenn Martin Company uh, in Baltimore, which had uh, started out uh, its work in airplane uh, design and, and building, but ended up uh, becoming part of the military-industrial complex with the sort of the, the advent of, of missiles like inter intercontinental ballistic missiles and intermediate range uh, ballistic missiles, were you know, part of the great doomsday machine that we began to build in the 1950s. And almost as a side contract, uh, they worked with NRL to build uh, what would be the follow-on to the V2s, the Viking rockets. Uh, these were improved. There were better materials. There was better guidance. Uh, there were kind of there was a gimbaled nozzles at the bottom, so they'd actually be steered a little bit better. All in all, it was more a rocket designed for research than for war. But they were very big and they were very expensive, so even those were fated to to not really be. Uh, in hand uh, all that long. It actually spawned some smaller uh, uh, rocket designs, uh, like the, the Aerobi, for example, with the uh, uh, applied physics lab that led to a, a cheaper way of doing certain kinds of experiments. Uh, the kinds of data that were uh, new data uh, that these uh, high-flying instruments were able to get here is, is sort of illustrated here uh, with a, a, a view of an uh, ultraviolet spectrum uh, showing parts of the spectrum that were just impossible to obtain from instruments on the ground because of absorption in the atmosphere. So once you get the instruments up there beyond the atmosphere, uh, you can see much more structure in the ultraviolet uh, uh, spectrum, and that then enables uh, a lot more good theorizing and, and modeling of just what's happening uh, with solar energy in the, in the upper atmosphere. So this sort of brings us in the mid-1950s, the Viking program, these rockets were being built Around that time, um, when really there was a, a tremendous international collaboration uh, to get a, 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 what we could think of as the, the best scientific portrait of 
uh, the Earth system that, that we had ever had. Uh, it's turned into a, a 62 country collaboration, thousands of scientists of all stripes. So there are uh, oceanographers and, and, and marine biologists and volcanologists and seismologists and uh, uh, atmospheric chemists and physics. Anybody who had anything to do with uh, understanding the Earth, and this would also be solar physicists, um, uh, were part of this International Geophysical Year. Most of the planning was going on in the 1950s, um, uh, although uh, the actual so, uh, International Geophysical Year itself unfolded over 18 months, so it's really an International Geophysical Year and a half. Um, and that really coincided with the, a, a, the, the solar maximum, which was the sort of the higher solar flux period of what really is a kind of 11-year cycle of the solar energy going up and down over 11 years. So the, in the 57, 58 was sort of at one of those peaks, uh, which uh, would be uh, an opportune time to do uh, certain kinds of studies, particular atmospheric studies. The pinnacle of this planning, though, was this idea that the uh, number of technologies had uh, converged, uh, fuel technologies, this overall rocket technologies, that the time had come where something really quite audacious could happen, which is to say uh, that a, 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 a satellite, a, a platform could be put into uh, orbit around the Earth with, uh, um, with uh, measuring instruments up there for the first time ever in, in history. Um, and uh, this was really a challenge. Nobody had done it. Nobody really knew how it would happen. Uh, but the uh, United States and the Soviet Union um, both said, we're going to do it. And uh, so both countries set off in their programs to develop uh, really what would be the world's first satellite, in this case, a, a scientific satellite. Um, so as a follow-on to the V2 work and the Viking uh, program, uh, NRL embarked on the Vanguard. Uh, there were several other suitors in the country that really wanted the job, but NRL got it because uh, it already was doing scientific rocket-based research, whereas, for example, Werner von Braun, who was one of the V2, the premier V2 engineers that the United States sopped up and, uh, and brought back in his expertise, he was really working on, on, uh, inter on, on ballistic missiles. Um, uh, the Jupiter missile, I think, was the one sort of at the t in this time frame. Uh, and the country uh, really wanted uh, everything about this Vanguard program to, 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 to be as much about science as possible. Um, and even though this was happening in the Naval Research Lab, uh, the, it, that group of, of upper atmosphere research, uh, researchers were, were considered to be part of almost the academic research community. Um, uh, so it just had much more of a sense that this, this was a, a, uh, a scientific project, not a military one. Uh, the Vanguard program involved a whole series of uh, engineering and test rockets and test satellites like this one, which would then lead to the operational ones. Uh, this was a time in rocket engineering when failure was just as likely or perhaps more likely than any kind of success. Um, and uh, and, so, and that, that was just part of the game at the time. Uh, so this is just an example of, of a little grapefruit-sized a uh, very minimal satellite that was going to go in, into sort of a later part of the test series of rockets. Uh, and then that would segue into a larger sort of basketball-sized ones that would actually have quite a lot of innovation, some of the very early solar cells, um, uh, uh, the, the uh, te telemetry uh, you know, into space for command and control and to get data back. All of this was brand new. Uh, on there also would be uh, sensors, again, mostly for uh, measuring solar energy, but also temperature sem sensors, pressure sensors, all you know, anything that they could do to learn about the conditions uh, of the upper atmosphere and, and uh, near Earth orbit. Uh, this was big news in the country. A lot of uh, the country was really paying attention. It was very exciting. Uh, this is just a picture from Life magazine kind of showing you an exploded view of all the stuff that was in there. And it's really kind of interesting to look at, at uh, you know, all of the sort of circuitry here. Uh, this is really before integrated circus, circuitry, but where solid state stuff is coming in. So they're beginning to really uh, uh, use solid state uh, devices. This culturally was actually very hard for the vacuum electronic guys who were very suspicious about all this. Uh, in fact, the, they, they used to use this metric of part number, and if the part numbers went up in these, uh, in these complicated systems, uh, usually the program managers would panic and say, no, 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 no. 
Uh, and so ironically, in the early part of so solid state science, the part numbers kept going up as you would replace, say, one vacuum tube with a bunch of these discrete pieces. But it, so sociologically, it was really quite an interesting uh, uh, technology uh, transition period. Uh, so we have this uh, Vanguard program happening as part of the International Geophysical Year, but uh, the world is turning, and at the same time, it's still the Cold War. Uh, and so uh, at the same time, uh, the Eisenhower administration is desperate to get as much information as it can about the heartland of the Soviet Union. Very difficult thing to do, uh, particularly uh, uh, re regarding uh, military installations, uh, military building activities. These are just two classic examples. The U-2 and the uh, SR-71 or Blackbird, which are stories unto themselves. Amazing photography, amazing film chemistry uh, technology was developed at this time. Uh, with Lockheed and, and the Skunk Works sort of, sort of being the, the center of, of at least the aircraft side of things, but great stories involving Kodak and Edwin Land and a lot of names that you know that were very much involved in very deep secret, deep black kinds of programs uh, for these uh, types of systems which were mostly photo reconnaissance, uh, uh, really getting photographic records of what's happening in the Soviet Union sort of in a, in a, in a cyclic way so you can see the differences over time. Uh, um, what NRL was all about, however, was ELINT or electronic intelligence, and I'll get to that in a minute, but basically what that means is can we listen in on the radio and radar chatter going on in the Soviet Union, and from that perhaps we can learn about the kinds of systems they have for monitoring and tracking, you know, st strategic bombers and, um, and the <coughs> ICBMs that uh, uh, in event of World War III, the U.S. sure would hope would get there uh, successfully kind of awful to think about, but that, that was the mentality. Uh, to give you a sense of just the audacity of engineering thinking at the time, uh, this was an idea conceived of by one of NRL's uh, bigger than life engineers, a guy named Alex Trexler. It's become, was known as the big ear. Uh, the idea, the, the cover story of this was of this 600 foot diameter parabolic dish steerable from horizon to horizon. You know, something of a pharaonic scale of, of engineering uh, nothing that size and that, that movable had ever been designed before um, in, in the history of humanity. And yet here we are in the Cold War where no audacious and crazy idea is crazy enough to not be green lighted uh, with the congressional uh, green, you know, go ahead and money. The cover story was that this was going to give the United States radio astronomy community uh, the, the, the leapfrog leap over anyone else. England was really the top dog at that time, but this, this was going to uh, blow them out of the water, so the U.S. was going to be on the top there. What Alex Trexler really had in mind, however, was that he knew he was going to need a very large collecting dish in order to, to pick up the extremely weak signals, radar signals from the Soviet Union that were bouncing off the natural moon, the moon that we, we, uh, are, is dear to our hearts and we look up in the sky every night, that those signals would bounce off the moon and get collected in this dish for about 20 minutes a day. That's, that's about when the, the uh, geometry would be right. Um, that was the real story behind this thing. Um, and, uh, and Congress approved it. It, was, it went in, in through a, a kind of insane process of being uh, um, sort of designed and built at the same time. So even before the thing is fully designed, trees are being cleared, concrete is being poured, all kinds of mistakes are being made. Uh, the, the NRL and, and its, al its partners in this have to keep going back to Congress saying more, 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 more. And eventually what happened is they, this, this went on long enough that a new technology uh, started to emerge, uh, which was hinted at in the IGY, right, the, that, set, that first scientific satellite, which would make at least the, the, uh, the reconnaissance uh, uh, a deep story about this uh, kind of moot. And something tremendous happens uh, on October 4th, 1957, which is uh, when the Soviet Union launches the world's first satellite, begins the space age with Sputnik 1, uh, which uh, flies uh, around the Earth and over the United States. I think it was Channel 4 that would pick up the beep, 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 and freak out the entire country every, every time that happened. Although a number of engineers were really excited about <coughs> scientists and who really saw this as a celebration uh, in a way of, of, of what humanity can do. But, but that might not have been the, the uh, perspective uh, 
by most people in the country. This probably represents it more. Uh, literally, communism is flying over the United States, and, and so, oh my god, you know, it's communism. Uh, the headlines uh, really say a lot here about kind of some of the different perspectives that uh, uh, you know, the different communities have. You know, this space age is here, is kind of very, uh, kind of a global perspective. Uh, Russia wins the race into outer space. That's more of a Cold War perspective. Red Moon over London is Cold War, but even more menacing. So there are all kinds of, of, uh, uh, of uh, you know, portraits of what, in fact, was going on with this achievement. Um, now, uh, the Soviet Union didn't stop there. You know, there was one poke in the rib. A month later comes this other one, which is a much deeper poke in the rib because this had much more throw weight, about 1,000 pounds uh, in, in the fairing and in, in the payload at the top and inside the fairing was a living creature. It was, uh, oh, uh, so I should, yes, and this, this is just gives you a sense of a, of a headline at that time. Uh, so this second one that went up in November, the second Sputnik 2 is carrying a dog, half ton spheres reported. So this is beginning to sound like something that could bring a weapon up into space, a very alarming idea. It's 900 miles up. Um, and inside was like a, the dog. Uh, so this was also a, a tremendous illustration that it's, it's, it's a demonstration that, that uh, you know, the space was probably going to be, become a place uh, where living things would go and the logic would be where people would end up. Uh, so this is a uh, Laika become, be, actually became a kind of cult figure, a Cosmo dog that, uh, that um, has uh, you know, websites and, and, and a cult following. Anybody here who has not been to the Museum of Jurassic Technology in Los Angeles Yes, that's the actual name of it. Um, it is a, it's one of the quirkiest uh, museums you're ever going to go to. In it is a room that is a shrine to the Cosmo dogs that lost their life uh, during this early Sputnik work. Each, and each dog has a little uh, um, uh, portrait like that and an, an eternal light underneath it. So it, it is worth a road trip just to go into that room. So when these uh, successes with Sputnik are, are electrifying the world, they're also uh, creating a lot of pressure back here on that Vanguard project. Remember the IGY project in the United States? Um, and uh, to, the, to the disbelief of the engineers working on that, James Haggerty, who was Eisenhower's uh, press secretary, tells the press corps, tells the world that the next uh, launch in the Vanguard series, which the engineers knew was TV3, which is Test Vehicle 3, was the actual answer to Sputnik. And all of those engineers at NRL said, oh no, he didn't do that, but he did, right? So, so now the country and the world is thinking that on December 6th, 1957, the US is finally is gonna you know, get some degree of parity with the Soviet Union. This is John Hagen, who was the, uh, the uh, head of the Vanguard project at NRL, later became part of the early leadership of NASA uh, at a press conference really showing reporters uh, what was going to happen with the launch of Vanguard 1, and the various phases of it, uh, when it would release uh, the satellite. So days are ticking. And here is, uh, it's getting closer. These are some of the, uh, the, the Vanguard engineers that are uh, now way at the top of, of, uh, of uh, the TV3 rocket, which would have that grapefruit size or test satellite in there. Uh, who, the, the man on the left is actually Roger Easton. He's not a household name, but he is one of the fathers of the global positioning system. Uh, and in the years following, he uh, would, would, would really create, generate the conceptual and technological basis uh, for uh, the global positioning system, which today we, we all use and has really been uh, world transforming in, in some ways. So it's uh, December 6th. It's, uh, it's launch day. There is the TB3 Vanguard rocket. This, this is actually a time when I, when I have to ask for a little bit of uh, audience participation. If you don't mind, a classic countdown for a rocket. If you're so inclined, if not, that's OK. But I'll start. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, and in front of the world. Uh, major networks with their cameras. Everybody sees this. The TV3 rocket lifts to about the altitude of our noses and then explodes uh, spectacularly in front of the world. Uh, let me see if this works. 
Uh, this, I, I hope I can play a, a, a little period piece. This was a DOD produced newsreel. Uh, just play one minute of this. The sound is great. Listen to the music. It's just wonderful. America's first attempt to launch a satellite. A six and a half inch sphere weighing just over three pounds was checked out by scientists and declared ready. A great wave of advanced publicity focused attention at Cape Canaveral, Florida for the launching of Test Vehicle 3 of Project Vanguard. A preliminary to the scheduled launching of a 21 pound satellite in March. What happened is already unhappy history. Another setback for the United States in the race into outer space. Here are official Defense Department films of the launching of the 72-foot missile, a loss of thrust, and fall back to Earth in split seconds. It's fantastic, and then a little, a little caveat. The cause is classified. Neither the satellite program nor our missile development is affected. Said acting defense secretary. It's all okay, right? It's all okay. So, uh, so uh, uh, that just, uh, I, I kind of love that, just partly for the sound, partly because of the way the the the, uh, the newscaster was talking. It's a, it's a great piece. Now, what you're looking at here is what was. Uh, um, harvested from that terrible conflagration, the way at the top in that black nose cone was, uh, in fact, that little satellite which uh, fell out and, and bounced a few times on the tarmac, rolled a little bit away from that fire, and Roger Easton, who I pointed out before, actually picked it up, took it home, but it ended up here in the Smithsonian Institution, the Air and Space Museum, so anybody who goes there uh, can get a look and, and see the sad little uh, satellite that uh, was not the answer to Sputnik on, on December 6, 1957. Uh, all kinds of uh, flagellation, self-inflicted and also from the world, so oh, what a flotnik. Apparently there was this joke that the, the Navy brass at the Pentagon had a new uh, salute and it went like this. <laughs> um, I, this made it into uh, popular culture with a playwright coming up with Kaputnik. Uh, this is a classified image that I, I had to go FOIA and get out from the Naval Research Laboratory. That's actually a joke. Uh, this is just my imagination of, of what the poor NRL engineers were like after all this happened, you know, head down in, in the gutter, uh, terribly drunk. And all along, Werner von Braun, who had, was, was uh, burning and, and upset that, that uh, the U.S. hadn't given uh, him uh, and, and his uh, rocket engineers really the, the go-ahead to, to uh, do the, the Vanguard program, uh, was all working on Plan B. Wasn't supposed to be. It was kind of, uh, he was being a bad boy. But in the end, the government was happy about it. Eisenhower administration greenlights it. Uh, at the end of January, they send up a Jupiter, it's really a, a missile, it's a military missile, they rename it Juno, so it sounds a little bit different. Um, and in there is, is a, a scientific package. Uh, among the people here is James Van Allen, and uh, this was some of the, this, uh, this uh, satellite or payload got some of the first measurements that really uh, began to characterize what became known as the, the Van Allen radiation belt. Now, <laughs> uh, there was a vindication for the Vanguard uh, guys, so uh, on uh, St. Patrick's Day, March 17th, they do the real thing. Rocket goes up, the big satellite is up there, and all of the uh, scientific uh, objectives actually are, are met, and, and historians look back at this and say that it really, despite that terrible uh, December 6th uh, moment, uh, that the, the program was a tremendous success, and a lot of the technological developments um, ended up evolving into uh, and being used by many other subsequent programs uh, particularly at NASA, which was in this year, 1958, uh, created by, uh, by Congressional Act, National Aeronautics and Space Act, um, in the summer. Uh, so this begins the civilian uh, space program, which now most people, if you ask them, well, what constitutes the US space program, they just say it's NASA. There's no sense that there's any other parts of it. Uh, 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 and, and this was sort of the beginning of it. Part of the, the act, uh, mandated that the entire Vanguard program at NRL transfer over into NASA. So uh, all of this work beginning in the late 1940s with the V2s and going through the Viking and the Vanguard, all of that expertise that had been developed in NRL suddenly gets uh, taken away and, and brought over to, uh, to uh, NASA the, uh, in, in its uh, nascent moment. 
But there still are some at Naval Research Lab who say, you know, the Navy's really got to stay in this space because this is going to be a part of not just the civilian world, but, but the, the military uh, and defense uh, world. Marty Vota up there uh, was sort of the, the main guy who had this insight, said we've got we to keep a capability here at NRL. Howard Lorenzen is known as the father of electronic warfare, um, did a lot of work in, in, in jamming and spoofing the, the V1 or the buzz bomb which at first was a, was a really horrific weapon, uh, particularly for, for Navy guys out there because they would hear the buzzing coming in. These weapons would come in. Uh, many lives were lost until uh, the, the countermeasures, the electronic countermeasures wizards, uh, NRL and a few other places came up with ways of, of essentially disarming that threat. They were able to kind of d uh, deflect with command and control. They kind of could take control of these and, and the, the, the uh, Germans just stopped using them. Reed Mayo uh, at the bottom now is going to play a big role in uh, what is going to emerge uh, out of this decimation of, of, uh, of the space technology work at NRL, but also the resurrection with just a few uh, individuals there uh, bringing in this sort of countermeasures and electronic warfare mentality, but marrying this now with the rocket technology that's in place. And in a late March Mm -hmm. Snowstorm, you have to imagine this with snow, out of Howard Johnson's. I could just find a 1950s Howard Johnson's, 1950, I could not actually find one with snow all around it. Uh, although right now, this is in Pennsylvania, I probably could go right now and, and get a picture of, of a Snowden uh, Howard Johnson. But he, uh, Reed Mayo, um, who I showed you before, the guy in the lower right, he's in a place like this with his family. They're snowed in, um, and he, um, he starts thinking. You know, when engineers start to think, it gets a little scary and dangerous. And he thinks back to something that he ran into in his countermeasures days during World War II, when he was actually running around the Pacific uh, and, and to the ships of, of the naval fleet and actually putting in uh, uh, countermeasures equipment. One of the other things that he was doing is whenever uh, electronic, new electronic equipment uh, from uh, uh, the Germans were, or Japanese for that matter, was, were, were captured. They would go to NRL. They would sort of do reverse engineering, figure out what's going on. One of the things that he got hold of was something called an Athos crystal. And these were uh, quartz crystals that were built into the, uh, the conning towers of the U-boats, um, you know, sort of uh, submarine uh, boats of, of, of uh, the German Navy. And these were sensitive to uh, certain ranges of, uh, of the electromagnetic uh, spectrum, uh, and in, in fact, the ranges of our early radar, and so these crystals would would uh, uh, be, pick up those signals, generate a little electric current, and then the, the captain inside would say, "Okay, looks like we're getting painted with a radar signal." Is the, the kind of language they used. Time to go underwater, and so Reed Mayo back there in, uh, um, in, in Howard Johnson said, "What if I took something like that and raised it?" Uh, the, the phrase he came up, raise the periscope several hundred miles, that is to say, on an orbiting platform. What then? And the idea was that with that kind of tool in that kind of place, it would be possible to really begin to get a picture of, of the radar, what's called radar order of battle, the radar capabilities of the Soviet Union. Um, and once again, uh, it, you don't really put rockets up uh, terribly secretly, although, by the way, there's going to be a launch at the Vandenberg Air Force Base tomorrow, so you go against the, to, to the cliffs, you might be able to see at 7.30 tomorrow uh, a launch of a, of a satellite. Uh, this was another case of, of the remnant space scientists at NRL. Again, these are still folks who are interested in that dynamic between the, the, uh, the sun and the upper atmosphere. They had an open, unclassified science payload. It became known as SOLRAD for solar radiation. Uh, but inside that was to be a, a second deep black, deep secret payload, which was going to become, become known as Grab One, originally known a little kind of comedically as Tattletail, uh, but that, that was a code name that actually seemed to be, which would certainly get out and seemed a little bit too revealing of, of perhaps what, what it was all about. So it became known as Grab, uh, which actually stands for Galactic Radiation Background Experiment. Uh, and that was inside the very same shell. So one shell, two payloads, one of them open, one of them secret. Um, and it, it was in 1958 when Eisenhower you know, kind of greenlighted a number of these kinds of what were then very high tech, leading edge uh, reconnaissance pr uh, projects around the country. 
A major event happens in uh, May 1st, 1960. The, the, shoot, the uh, uh, Soviet Union shoots down uh, a U-2 uh, uh, high-flying airplane with Gary Powers inside. The, the US uh, very unsuccessfully tried to claim these were just meteorological overflies. We just want to know about the weather in the Soviet Union. Uh, but that did not fly. And this became a huge, uh, very anxious uh, time in the Cold War. Um, uh, Gary Powers was you know, publicly tried, and there's Nick Khrushchev uh, uh, you know, pointing out the wreckage. Um, and so this was kind of a real PR point you know, for the Soviet Union during the Cold War. Um, so, and the other thing that this did is it took away a, a, a rare uh, uh, reconnaissance tool. So, so this grounded all the U-2s, any overflights, and so suddenly now the country is blind to, uh, to kind of what kind of radar capabilities the Soviet Union has. Uh, this is one of the kinds of, of uh, um, uh, kind of slides, or this was also in chart form, that the proponents of Tattletail Grab One were taking around to um, uh, brass in, in the Pentagon, uh, you know, describing some of the capabilities that this new tool would have to really look at this, these sort of S-band radar equipment, really get a sense of what kind, where and how much uh, electronic warfare uh, R&D was going on in the Soviet Union. I'm just going to go quickly through a couple of the slides. These were, these were enormous, really bulky charts that were carried around in, in, in enormous portfolios, um, which had locks on them. And they would, uh, so th you know, there would be teams of, of um, you know, sort of NRL leadership that would go around to you know various secretaries and undersecretaries and really kind of make a point that this 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 was important technology um, you know in the Cold War. So this just sh sort of shows uh, what a grab satellite would would be able to see as it goes over that very red place, the Soviet Union. Um, it sees really most of the territory, um, and in this case, when I say see, it really is listening now to to electromagnetic signals. Um, uh, just another example showing uh, what a satellite at, at different altitudes would be able to sort of detect uh, with respect to two of the most well-known uh, radar systems at the time in the Soviet Union, which were codenamed Gage and Token. Uh, one of the, this was yet another one of the, of the uh, charts that were <laughs> taken around. You'll see NSA, and it is in fact the same NSA that's been in the news the last couple of years in, in a very big way. National Security Agency, in fact, was going to be one of the two major um, recipients of this ELINT, this electronic intelligence data about the radar systems in the Soviet Union. And again, why is radar so important? Because that's how the Soviet Un Union would know, where, you know if and when uh, nuclear bombers, our nuclear bombers were on the way, and if and when our intercontinental uh, ballistic missiles were on their way. Um, and so uh, you know, radar systems were huge parts of the overall kind of doomsday scenario. Um, and if, uh, if the detection was really great, uh, that would then be a strategic disadvantage in, in, in the event of, of World War III. Um, the, other, the other major customer or recipient of the ELINT data was, this, was the Strategic Air Command. And that, that was in Omaha, Nebraska. And they, they needed this data to plan out their uh, flight courses of, of the big strategic bombers. And they would try to do that by, by kind of skirting around and being as less visible to the radar systems that were known as possible. Uh, and the way this worked, so the satellites were, were picking up the signals. And there was something called like a bent pipe. So the signals would come in. They were not stored initially. Storage technology, tape recording technology, all of this was either conceptual or very new. Certainly not space worthy at the time. So most, there was hardly any recording. It was actually in kind of real time uh, 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 relayed down to uh, something like this, a little reception hut here. Uh, one thing I'll point out, which I really like, was uh, uh, right there, there's a steering mechanism that, it, that was manually steered inside. You know, so when there was an overflight of the satellite, some, uh, an operator inside would literally have to steer that Yagi uh, antenna at the top to try to track along with that uh, overpass of maybe 15, 20 minutes to maximize the, the, uh, the harvest of data. And uh, this was literally, these are Mack truck steering wheels that uh, were very proudly obtained for, I think it was $8 per copy at the time. Um, and there were a number of these huts that were put around uh, the periphery of the Soviet Union and in other friendly countries so, so that um, uh, the data could be Im immediately uh, transferred you know, once it's obtained and then bent right back down. In 19, it was not until 1998 that any aspect of the GRAB program was actually declassified. 
at that time, this is sort of a summary uh, image that was produced by the Navy uh, Naval Research Lab, which kind of shows you all of the components of the system that, that I just told you about. So I'm not going to go through um, and explain that at the moment. Uh, so it was uh, the, the grab program is uh, is is uh, green lighted into an operational uh, uh, phase uh, with the Gary Powers uh, shoot down in May. Actually, it's four days later is when Eisenhower says to NRL, you are a go. Get, get your satellite up as soon as possible. Turns out that there was a, another satellite that was, gonna, that was slated to go up in June uh, of that, of 1960. Uh, and that, what you see there with, with this kind of spiral pattern is known as a transit satellite. This was a satellite built, designed and built by uh, the Applied Physics Lab. And it, is an, it was one of the world's first navigation satellites really in some ways a precursor to the GPS system. Its primary role was to work with the nuclear, I mean with the submarine part of the nuclear triad. Um, and, and, and its role was to enable submarines to get a very solid navigational, geolocational fix as it's out there in the middle of the, of the ocean. Because if you're gonna get a nuclear warhead from where you are to a particular target, you have to know where, you're, where you are. Hard to do in the ocean. That's what the transit system was all about. On top of that goes the Grab One, SOLRAD-1 satellite, uh, the first what's called piggyback uh, launch, two, two uh, satellites, one rocket. Uh, there you see it in the fairing. And on June 22, 1960, out of Cape Canaveral, rocket goes up, successfully places both of these uh, uh, satellites in orbit. And what we have now is one of the major firsts of the space age, that, but that no one can say anything about. Absolutely secret. Um, uh, it is the world's first uh, spy satellite. So, so in two years, there's a huge increase in the size of things that can put into orbit. Oh, the, the pace of, of development in those early years and the frequency at which rockets were going up is mind-boggling. Right now, now there's sort of a launch. Well, you know, actually, if you look at the rockets going on around the world, if you see a manifest, it still is pretty frequent. It's just not sort of in our minds so much. But at this time. I mean, it's almost like every other day somebody is sending some rocket up. Is that an Atlas rocket? Uh, that one, I don't think that's an Atlas, but I, I'd have to you know, check to see what, what, the, what the actual booster is. Uh, you know, this, this was uh, something to be proud of. Uh, it is a first to have two satellites go up. Uh, this is just an example from the Washington Post, hailed as a big space game for the US, go US. Um, most people think that the first spy satellite was actually a photo reconnaissance program known as Corona. There's been a lot of, of uh, scholarship on that, whole books written on it. And Corona, in fact, that program was going on at the same time, but it was failing, failing, failing. It took actually 12 failures. We're talking about exploded rockets or rockets that went off a ways and then the, 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 the safety officer would have to destroy them because they were going toward uh, you know, populated areas or, or uh, all kinds of failure modes. There was a, lo a lot of learning by failure at that time. Uh, but uh, April 12, 1960, so this is only two months later, the f this first uh, photo reconnaissance, uh, set or, or orbiting photo reconnaissance platform does make it into space. Actually, this first one I, I just read uh, was, was, um, did not take pictures. It was one about a week later, just one week later, uh, it, was, it was the 14th launch that had a, a package like this with absolutely remarkable photo, photographic technology, which is really worth uh, uh, learning about. And this one then was caught in midair. So the way this would work is the photographs would be uh, taken while in orbit. Once the film was, uh, was used up, uh, there was a mechanism to kind of eject a, a very hardy canister that would go back through the atmosphere and then it would uh, come down with a parachute and would literally be snatched out of the air uh, by an Air Force uh, uh, aircraft. And, and, and this actually worked. And it generated some of the, some of the most important uh, photo reconnaissance uh, intelligence uh, for Eisenhower during the entire Cold War because it helped him realize that there was no r missile gap and there was no bomber gap. And these were things that the hawks of, of the country were saying, uh, this is terrible. We need, we need to put you know, everything we got in, into uh, making these, these weapons. Eisenhower had a certain degree of serenity on his side because he had data and he knew uh, that the, the, the arguments that there's a bomber gap and a, and a missile gap uh, to justify that kind of uh, federal expense just was not there. 
Um, and he's the one that really did sort of talk up the whole idea of this, the concerns about a military industrial complex. He could see uh, that there were different kinds of drivers uh, perceived or, or, or real uh, that um, you know, just had a very difficult and complex dynamic that the, the nation really had to worry about. Uh, grab one uh, was a proof of principle. Uh, when some of those guys I showed before, Howard Lorenzen, Reed Mayo, those were the, some of those guys in that, in that sort of trio of, of, of person images that I showed you earlier. When they were in, in, in a, uh, an interrogation hut um, in Hawaii and they first flicked on this receiving switch, they, they heard what, what they couldn't believe. It was this absolute cacophony. They thought something was wrong. They thought that the, they had blown it, that the, the sensor was picking up all kinds of things that it shouldn't be. Um, uh, that there was something wrong with the overall system. And uh, it took them a while to realize that no, what they were listening to was, was that the Soviet Union, in fact, more than missiles and bombers, were actually working much more on, on the radar, sort of the detection kind of system, a sense that with information might be more, at least as important as the weaponry. Um, so once they realized that, that the, the harvest that they were getting was, was that good, um, and they were able to document it, the program was, was continued. There were a total of, of five uh, attempts in the GRAB program, only two of them worked. One was June 22nd. There was a failure, then there was a, a success uh, in about a year after the first success, so that would be uh, June of 61, followed by three failures. Uh, this is just a picture that was only declassified in 1998 that shows you, uh, uh, you know, sort of the, the great uh, fa fashion of the day in, in, the, in the 50s and 60s, uh, and, and this is the team uh, that was really behind uh, that that black package, the, the, the classified package that was inside, um, inside the same shell as the, uh, the SOLRAD-1 satellite. Uh, the success of GRAB-1 uh, led to a follow-on program called the Poppy System. This is the only other uh, ELINT or electronic intelligence satellite program that it, to, to this date, at least with Naval Research Laboratory's concern, has been declassified. A, you know, a sleuthing person going to the the, the great oracle, which is to say the internet actually can find out a little bit more. Um, but uh, for me to tell you that right now would, would actually be illegal for me to do. But it's, it's something that is possible to do. The Poppy system had seven launches. These were augmented. These were all, all, all along building on new technologies, new solid state technology, new sensor technology. So it's getting better and better all along rather than what was called the, the one ball launch. These were two ball and ultimately four, four ball launches, meaning each ball being a satellite. And that gave new kinds of capabilities. And in particular, the Poppy system showed with the multiple satellites that they could really ge geolocate uh, the, 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 where those emissions were coming from, ultimately even uh, finding out that they could geolocate systems from individual ships in the sea. And that ha has led to uh, an enormous program now. It's called Maritime Domain Awareness. It's at least the seed of it. It's not a direct line. Uh, where uh, the, the country is, uh, is, is capable of literally tracking hundreds of thousands of ships on the world's ocean simultaneously all the time, everywhere. Kind of scary. Um, the Poppy system, 62 to, to 1977, uh, that's when it is ended and some follow-on system with, with a name that cannot be uttered um, starts up. And uh, it is this technology that builds and builds and builds to the systems that we have today, the ELIM systems that are in place today. A uh, couple of uh, images of the first two sets of poppies, poppy one, poppy two. Um, you can go to another crazy museum uh, north of, uh, of Washington, D.C., about, Washington, D.C., about 30 miles north. It's called the National Cryptological Museum. It's associated with the National Security Agency. It's free. It's a great day trip if you're there. And in there are models of, of um, of the, uh, the, a, a grab and a poppy satellite. Uh, you learn all kinds of amazing things about sort of a, a side of, of World War II and the kind of invisible electromagnetic aspects of, of warfare that, that you might not know about. It's all really quite interesting. I'll just zip through. These are images from poppy that, uh, which the fact of which, by the way, was declassified only in 2005. So what that means when you say the fact of something is declassified, it mostly just means the name and the most rudimentary aspects of it. Um, uh, and, and really most of the technical aspects uh, remain, remain classified. Um, and in June of 2012, the National Reconnaissance Office, which is the part of the federal uh, uh, intelligence apparatus, 
and set of agencies that, that is in charge of, of spy satellites, did release a, what, what uh, in a kind of official history of the grab and poppy, but half of it is redacted, right? So when you look at it, there's all this black stuff, right? And you can't quite make out. It's very, actually the redactors are almost sadistic because they take out just enough of a sentence here and there that you really can't make the sense of the sentence, right? There's sort of like prepositions they leave in there and articles, and, but, but you can't actually uh, get a full interpretation from, from a lot of that material. Uh, uh, here is just a manifest. This, this is declassified that shows you the, uh, you know, the partial success of Grab One, and then the, the much better track record that uh, that Poppy uh, uh, enjoyed. And um, kind of as I come into the to the finish here, this is just a, 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 one of my favorite movies of, of all time, uh, is Doctor Strangelove, and there's just many many scenes in there where these strategic bombers are kind of hugging the terrain in the Soviet Union. Uh, and, it, it, and Kubrick is kind of amazing to me because he, he, he somehow had to know something about, uh, uh, about where, where electronic intelligence is coming in to say where are the, you know, the kind of the satellite, the, the uh, radar installations that would be looking for these things because, you know, there is a kind of flat, flight path that seems to be trying to avoid that kind of detection. I might be reading too much into it, but I want to uh, think about it because I get to show this slide, um, which is Slim Pickens. Um, on one of those strategic bombers at the last moment of the movie, and he's straddling this nuclear uh, uh, weapon that, that is going down to a radar installation, installation down at the bottom. It's a big antenna down there. He's, you can't see it, but he's blocked out. Um, and uh, just a reminder that that story that I just told you about the world's first satellite, uh, spy satellite, is just a very small uh, episode of the, the Naval Research Lab's history in, in the U.S. space program, you know, which begins uh, way up at the top in that time era that we've been talking about, but goes all the way down to the bottom. Uh, so the count now is about 100 payloads um, since the Naval Research Laboratory got into the space game. Um, and before I finish, I just want to thank uh, Greg and the Kavli Institute for this tremendous opportunity for me to be here. It's, not, uh, it's a very rare thing for writers to have what is effectively a sabbatical and to be in a place where some of the greatest questions that one can ask are being asked by some of the brilliant mind, most brilliant minds that can ask them. So it's just a public thank you uh, for the opportunity and thank you all for your attention here. Uh, yes, NRL. Uh, it's, it's an organization now called the Naval Center for Space Technology. I actually got that, that name in 1986. Um, and it is one of the few places uh, that remains where uh, there's, there's a range of skill sets uh, such that you, you know, the, a, a payload can be conceived of, designed, built, have to go elsewhere for the launch, but then also operated. So not in here at all is, is, uh, are some of the command and control centers. There's a place called Blossom Point in Maryland uh, near, uh, along the uh, Chesapeake Bay, uh, which, is, which is one of the, the nation's premier uh, command and control centers, not only for NRL satellites, but actually for many other customers who, who uh, want to kind of farm out that sort of service. Um, it, but it is under some, some threat. It's not in its heyday right now. And there's, there's a fair amount of anxiety about you know, just, just what it's, uh, what, 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 you know, what its future will, will be and how long it will have a future. I think it, the Defense Department would want these capabilities, but you wouldn't think it would be associated with a particular service. Well, you know, the, the first part of what you said, you know, that's what, what they're all screaming about over there all the time. You know, look what we can do. You don't want to dismantle us. Um, uh, I mean, in the course, uh, what, what I didn't really talk about here is, you know, the evolution of satellite technology, you know, for a good while was, was bigger, bigger, more complex, more expensive. NRL in many ways is a, is a, is a kind of, you know, small and, and um, humble operation. So as things got bigger, uh, you know, more risky, uh, more money online, uh, the, 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 a relationship between labs like this and then the contractors uh, that would actually kind of get handed off a lot of the early engineering and development work, um, that kind of dynamic started to kick in, particularly in the 1980s. So in the early years of NRL, it, it, had, it had its sugar daddy, which was the, the, the National Reconnaissance Office. It's, you know, there was no issue with money whatsoever. But around that time, 
Uh, so we're talking now in, in, about in the 80s, late 70s, uh, there, was, there was sort of mandate from leadership that said uh, a lot of the, this work has to be farmed out to, uh, you know, like the McDonnell Douglases of the world and, and Northrop's of the world. Um, and at that time, there, to adapt to that reality, Naval Research Laboratory started to find um, other, other customers, like at that time in the early 80s, the Strategic Defense Initiative, for example, came in. And they did a number of, of major uh, satellite programs for them. But their, their customer base really is, is quite wide, widespread now. And so uh, they're also doing stuff for NOAA uh, and, and the you know, NOAA, I always forget how it's mul the multi-syllabic oceanographic and, uh, uh, organization in the Department of Commerce. Uh, so, um, you know, so there's been an evolution of, of kind of who they work with, what kind of work they do. Do you know when the first Russian Ellen satellite was launched? Yes, uh, it, it was called a Zenit, I believe, X-E-M-I-T. Uh, I'd have to, to be sure, I would want to go back uh, and confirm it, but I think it was 1965. So it, it was a considerable uh, number of years after that 1960 um, ELINT, uh, uh, you know, grab one uh, success. So are the Soviet records uh, accessible? Some, yeah. I mean, that, that's been coming out. There's actually a, a set of four volumes by one of the, the giants of the Soviet space program that worked with, uh, it might have been with the Smithsonian, but there's these four mm -hmm. huge volumes uh, that have helped to bring out some of that. Yeah. Are, are most of them photographic now? Uh, you mean the... the uh, we can't know. My guess is, there, I mean, there, there's certainly a, a photograph, a photo reconnaissance going on, but, but ELINT uh, continues to be a, a hugely important uh, uh, part of, of the reconnaissance program of, of you know, lots of countries. So no, there's, there's still ELINT up there. And, every, and not just there. There's also ground-based uh, electronic intelligence. And uh, probably uh, KITP is listening to all of us in the hallways. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there's camera. Look at that. See, I mean, there's an Opticon <laughs> up there. I mean, this place is riddled with surveillance tools. So, uh, uh, any other questions? Well, before we thank Ivan, I'd just like to uh, sh announce that tonight is uh, the first Cafe KITP. This is an activity which Ivan helped us nucleate. Uh, it's at Soho downtown. It starts at 5:15-ish or. Uh, well, doors open at 5, the program 5.30 or soon there something, after. Yeah, something between 5 and 5.30. Uh, and uh, the announcement uh, is here. I can send you one if you send me an email. Or you can look at today's Daily Nexus, and they wrote a full page about it. So uh, I encourage everyone who wants to to come to that. There's food and drink. It's a restaurant. And, uh, Mateo, our own Mateo Cantiello will be the uh, speaker, and Ivan will be the discussion. Well, interlocutor, I think, is what we I, I like that word. Yeah. Called it. It's called, uh, the, the, the title of the event is called Music of the Spheres, uh, the Secret Songs of Stars. So I thank hope you. To see some of you there. Anyway, thank you, Ivan, for all your contributions. Yeah. Thank you.